get started talking about the Odyssey in much detail. Um, I do want to talk a little bit about uh, you know something that's coming up. We all knew this would happen eventually. It's maybe happening sooner than some of us expected. All right. So on the syllabus, it says that the midterm exam is going to be on September 26th, right? So I'm actually going to move that back. I'm actually going to move that forward a day, right? So it's going to be on the 28th. I will make the adjustment in the syllabus on Georgia View so that it reflects that. But yeah, the midterm will take place here in class. Um, on the 28th of September. If you require separate testing accommodation, that's something that you need to set up with disability services. Right, and then um, I will send them a copy of the test in an exam book um, and you'll go over to their offices and take it. Um, <clears throat> I will provide blue books for you uh, because, frankly, I think it's bullshit that they make you pay for them. Um, so, they'll be here when you get here. Now, as far as the format of the exam is concerned, right, it's going to be in two parts. The first part is going to be a short essay section. And you will choose one of three essay questions to answer. In roughly three to five pages of exam book paper. Right now by pages I mean sides of a page, right? So this would be a page, this would be a page, right? I don't mean that you need like, you know, a full page, right? I'm not talking about both sides, right? So one side of a page counts as a page as far as this is concerned, right? And I will give you sample exam questions next week to help you study. Um, these will not be the questions that will appear on the exam, but they'll be the kind of questions that will appear on the exam. So it'll give you some idea of what sorts of things I'm going to be asking you when it comes time for the exam, right? So if you write, you know, use the sample essays to, you know, maybe sample questions to write maybe a practice essay or two, then you should be pretty well prepared. The second portion will be identification. So I am going to give you 12 terms, you'll choose eight. Bless you. And these terms can be characters from, from a text, they can be places in a text, they can be theoretical concepts that we've talked about in relation to particular texts. So what you're gonna give me when you do the identification you're going to give me the name of the text to which it's relevant. The name of the author, if known. And by if known, I mean if known to history, not simply if known to you, right? So if the name of the author is unknown to history, what do we put down? Anonymous. Anonymous would be the way to go, yeah. name of text, name of author, and then you're going to give me about a paragraph defining the term. And explaining why it matters, why it's important. Does anybody have any questions about this. Yeah, Jenna. Are you going to give us sample terms? 
No, I'm not going to give you sample terms. I will give you sample <coughs> essay questions. The terms, though, should all be in your notes. Right? I'm not going to give you anything that we didn't talk about specifically in class. So if you have the notes, even if you, you go back and watch the videos on YouTube, right, everything will be there. Right? Nothing we did not discuss specifically in class. Any other questions? Yeah, Regan. Reagan. Do you think it'll be like, because in class we kind of talk about the history of mm -hmm. the time period and stuff. Like sure. If it does include that, then we can talk more about It may include some historical terms, yeah. So yeah, just know which texts those are relevant to. Anything else? Other questions? Yeah, Frank. That's what we just read on um, the uh, Iliad and the Odyssey. If it's something that's uh, Greek that covers both of them, do we list both of them? Um, I, I will accept one or the other. Right? You won't get extra points for naming both. It if it's just like blindly obvious that it's like it's something particularly Greek that's in both of them. Yeah, if it's something that's that's particularly Greek that appears in both, um, yeah, go with the one that you see that seems to you most relevant. But yeah, I mean, you you will if it can apply to either, you, I'll give you credit for either answer. Other questions? Okay, so the sorts of things that we will be putting on the IDs, right? Um, I may ask you, for example, who or what Tiamat is, right? So how would you answer that? Tiamat is the ancient Gilgamesh mother goddess. OK, what text do we find Tiamat in? Think way, way back, beginning of semester. Enuma yes, she's in the Enuma Elish. And who wrote it? Enuma Elish. And who wrote the Enuma Elish? Yeah, who friggin' knows, right? No known author. And so then, what is Tiamat? As specifically as possible. She's the mother goddess or the dragon from. Okay. okay. She is the mother goddess of the Babylonians, circa around what, 10 BC when this was. Okay. Written. She was also killed by the sky god. Be able to birth the world, form the world better body. Mm -hmm. um, right. She was also uh, represented salt, water, correct? It represents salt water as well. Yep. So that would be an acceptable answer for one of the IDs, right? You give me the text, you give me the author, if known, and then you tell me what it is and why it matters to the text, right? Um, as far as the text, the exam will cover, right? It will cover everything up to the exam date. So that means it will cover, right, Enuma Elish, Gilgamesh, The selections from Genesis, it will cover the Iliad, the Odyssey, Sappho, and Medea, and it will cover Ovid. Right, the Metamorphoses. So 
So essentially, what we've been looking at in this first half of the class has been the literature of the ancient Mediterranean. And once we're past the midterm exam, we'll be moving on from the Mediterranean to other parts of the world. Right? I think we're going to be moving directly after the, uh, after the midterm um, to ancient Indian literature. So, pardon? Metamorphoses. M-E-T-A-M-O-R-P-H-O-S-E-S. So, Middle East, ancient Middle Eastern, ancient Greek, ancient Roman. Right, those are the three cultures we're covering on the midterm exam. So does anybody have any further questions about the exam before we proceed, before we get back to Odysseus? No? We're all clear? All right, we'll get the sample questions next week. I'll update the syllabus. And we'll go from there. All right, so back to Homer then, back to the Odyssey. What'd you think? Okay, why would you, what, what makes you th uh, think that the discussion of farming is repetitive, Sarah? It disappears a lot. Like, like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, can you, uh, <laughs> pardon? Like, oh, that's I'm okay. Mark all of it, so. Okay, so you, yeah, so you, so you marked all of them. Do you notice something? that's happening each time he's talking about farming? He relates it to being civilized, like how people are set to Yeah, I mean, that's part of his test of civilization, right? Now, for someone who is wandering with a small crew across the seas, setting in on unknown islands, why might it be important for him to observe whether or not people on a given island practice farming? If they practice farming, what else are they likely to practice? Not eating you. <laughs> okay, yeah, they're less likely to eat you, right? So we see when he lands, for example, on the island of the Cyclops, Right, on page 273, we sailed on, our morale sinking, and we came to the land of the Cyclops, lawless savages who leave everything up to the gods. These people neither plow nor plant, but everything grows with them unsown. Wheat, barley, and vines that bear clusters of grapes, watered by rain from Zeus. They have no assemblies or laws, but live in high mountain caves, ruling their own children and wives and ignoring each other. So the Cyclopses don't farm. Farming Yeah, what else? He also mentions in this same passage their level of social organization, right? And what is their basic social unit? Family. Yeah, just single families, right? There is no government here. There is no, what the Greeks would call a polis, right? There's no city. It's just individual families living in caves, ignoring each other. So the Cyclops don't really have a society. And indeed, when um, Odysseus wounds the Cyclops, what do his neighbors do? How do his neighbors respond? Nobody is far. Yeah, so, well, what, are you, what are you crying about? Shut up, right? Nobody really tries to help him. Right, they have no real social bonds with each other. A fertile island 
slants across the harbor's mouth, neither very close nor, very, nor far from the Cyclops shore. It's well wooded and populated with innumerable wild goats, uninhibited by human traffic. Not even hunters go there, tramping through the woods and roughing it on the mountainsides. It pastures no flocks, has no tilled fields, unplowed, unsown, virgin forever, bereft of men. All it does is support those bleeding goats. The Cyclops do not sail and have no craftsmen to build them benched, red proud ships that could supply all their wants, crossing the sea to, the, uh, to other cities, visiting each other as other men do. These same craftsmen would have made this island into a good settlement. It's not a bad place at all and would bear everything in season. So what's Odysseus observing about the conditions on the Cyclops Island? Make a good place for a city. Yeah, this would make a great place for a settlement, a great place for a city. But the Cyclops don't practice civilized arts of any kind. They don't farm, they don't build ships, they just let their goats run wild and let everything get overgrown, right? So they have this beautiful fertile place that could really be something if only they would organize it. And what we have here is an example of, sort of the Greek love of order and rationality. Right? A place that is disorderly is a bad place for the Greeks. A place that is cultivated, parceled out into proportional plots, farmed appropriately. These are the sorts of places they like. These are the sorts of places they prefer. These are the sorts of, pla sorts of places they consider to be civilized. Now, what other clues do we have about the Cyclops that tell us that he is uncivilized? Before he even goes and starts eating people. The fact that he herds them? Mm-hmm. He's a herdsman, yeah. He's not a farmer, he's a herdsman. Right, we talked a little bit about this last time. Right, you know, we saw in the book of Genesis, um, the ancient Israelites preferred herdsmen to farmers because farming was this sort of um, reminder of the conditions of original sin. Right, you will be forced to work the earth to get your bread. But the Greeks definitely prefer farming to herding. Farming is something civilized people do. Herding is something barbarians do. The Cyclops is a herdsman, therefore he is a barbarian. There is one other sign of barbarism here that comes after he starts eating people. And this is something that I don't necessarily expect you to recognize um, because I don't know how much you know about ancient Greek wine. If we look on page 278, His chores done, again he seized two of my men and made his meal. Then I went up to the Cyclops and spoke to him, holding an ivy wood bowl filled with dark wine. Cyclops, have some wine, now that you have eaten what your human flesh, so you can see what kind of drink was in our ship's hold. I was bringing it to you as an offering, hoping you would pity me and help me get home. But you are a raving maniac. How do you expect any other man ever to visit you after acting like this? He took the bowl and drank it off, relishing every last sweet drop, and he asked me for more. Be a pal and give me another drink. And tell me your name so I can give you a gift you'll like. Wine grapes grow in the Cyclops land, too. Rain from the sky makes them grow from the earth. But this, this is straight ambrosia and nectar. Now, if the Cyclops was civilized, he would not simply pick up the bowl and drain it. Greek wine uh, was sort of more like a concentrate. Do did, did, did y'all know what I mean by that? Like if you buy like... Kind of rich and thick and have quite a bit of alcohol in it. Yeah, it's, it, was basically, yeah, it was basically a syrup that you were supposed to add water to. Right, Odysseus mentions elsewhere, like when they mixed, when he and his men mixed the wine, they added like 20 parts water to one part wine because it's that potent. So the Cyclops just takes this inky dark stuff, the consistency of cough syrup, 
and guzzles it down. He doesn't know that he's supposed to mix it. He doesn't understand that he's supposed to mix it, right? Again, sign of, a bar sign of a barbarian. But this particular episode teaches Odysseus an awful lot about how to behave and what to look for on future islands, right? So why is it that he keeps looking for tilled and cultivated <coughs> fields every island he lands on? So he eat again? Yeah, if he doesn't see them, something bad happens, right? Now we see some, if we, if we look at the episode with the Lestragonians, right, these other giant cannibals, in a lot of ways, it's kind of similar to the Cyclops episode, <coughs> so much so that some scholars have suggested that it's actually the same episode, just sort of altered uh, slightly to fill in space. But the Lestragonians episode is actually slightly different. If we go to that for a moment, That is page 5. Is it actually the next place they visit? No. All right. Um, whoever was talking about farming. Um, 286. 286. Thank you. Right. Let's look on page 285. They've been sent out from the house of Aeolus, the keeper of the winds. More on Aeolus in a minute. With that, he sent me from his house, groaning heavily. We sailed on from there with grief in our hearts. Because of our folly, there was no breeze to push us along, and our morale sank because the rowing was hard. We sailed on for six solid days and nights, and on the seventh we came to Lamas, the lofty city of Telepolis, in the land of the Lestragonians, where a herdsman driving his flo flocks at dusk calls to another driving his out at dawn. A man could earn a double wage there if he never slept, one by herding cattle and another by pasturing white sheep, for night and day make one twilight there. The harbor we came to is a glorious place, surrounded by sheer cliffs. Headlands jut out on either side to form a narrow mouth, and there all the others steered in their ships and moored them close together in the bay. No wave, large or small, ever rocks a boat in that silvery calm. I alone moored my black ship outside the harbor, tying her up, on the rocks that lie on the border of the land. Then I climbed to a rugged lookout point and surveyed the scene. There was no sign of plowed fields, only smoke rising up from the land. So what does Odysseus learn to do? Um, check for those signs of civilization. Yes, spy out the land first, right? He ties his ship off outside the harbor, then gets up to look around for signs of civilization. And are there signs of civilization on this island? Yeah, what have they got? They have herding, they have a city, but it's herding. Yep, they, they have, have a farms. Yeah, they do have a city, but it's herdsmen rather than farmers. Yeah, so that is a danger sign. <clears throat> And what happens when he sends his men ashore? I sent out a team, two picked men and a herald, to reconnoiter and find out who lived there. They went ashore and followed a smooth road used by wagons to bring wood from the mountains down to the city. In front of the city, they met a girl drawing water. Her father was named Antiphides, and she had come down to the flowing spring Artesia, from which they carried water to the town. When my men came up to her and asked her who the people there were and who was their king, she showed them her father's high-roofed house. So what is this episode starting to sort of look like a little bit? That we've already, what part that we've already read? Does this seem to resemble a bit? Yeah, exactly, Ty, yes. This is a sort of dark double to the Nausicaa episode, right? Right. In that episode, the girl bathing down by the water with her companions 
points Odysseus in the direction of help. Here, the king's daughter points Odysseus's men in the direction of giant cannibals who are going to eat them. Right, so the signs of civilization can be deceptive. Right, what, he's, what he's looking for, what he needs to find, is a place that has all the elements of civilization, if he really wants help without danger. And in various ways, each of the islands Odysseus visits in this part of his journey present him with a sort of alternative to ordinary Greek life. Right? All of the people he meets, civilized or uncivilized, relatively civilized or uncivilized anyway, um, have practices that are not Greek. For example, to go back to Aeolus, right, the keeper of the winds. What does Aeolus practice that suggests he's civilized? What does he do when Odysseus shows up outside his palace? He welcomes him in. Yeah, welcomes him in. And what else? Does he just say, sure, you can hang out here for a bit? What does he give him? Well, if you are a civilized person, what are you supposed to give to a guest? Feast, food, and drink. Feast, food, and drink, and a parting gift of some sort, right? Right. When your guest is going away, you are supposed to give him or her a present. What does Aeolus give? Mm -hmm. gods. Yep, all of the unfavorable winds that would keep Odysseus away from Ithaca, away from his home, bagged up in this leather sack so that he can just row his way straight to Ithaca and everything will be great, right? And what happens? They get from the side of the shore and all of a sudden his men just jump on the open bag. Yeah, he falls asleep. His men don't trust him. He's like, why does he always get all the gifts, right? He gets all the spoils. We do all the work. What the hell? Let's see what's in this bag. Open it up and it blows them off course. In fact, it blows them right back to Aeolus Palace, right? Yeah. What are you doing back here? Is Aeolus obligated by the laws of hospitality to help Odysseus a second time? No, right? If you come back begging for more, I don't have to help you, right? I've already done for you what was in my power. The fact that you mucked it up is not my fault, right? Clearly, you are someone whom the gods hate. Clearly, you are cursed. Away from my doorstep. Now, what is unusual? Like, we see that Aeolus obeys the basic laws of hospitality. But what's unusual about his palace, about his island? About his people? Surrounded by indestructible bronze. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, his his floating island is surrounded by a by a wall. Does anybody here seem to do any work? Everybody here just takes their ease all the time, right? No one works. And what about their family and social relations? What are they like? Aeolus, 12 children live there with him, six daughters and six manly sons. Yes, they're incestuous.
this is a decidedly non-Greek practice. There were other neighboring cultures in which aristocratic families often married brothers to sisters in order to keep power and control within the same family, right? In order to try to keep bloodlines, quote unquote, pure. Uh, the Egyptians, for example, were kind of notorious for this. Um, this is why, you know, at a certain period in Egyptian artistic history, um, you see statues of some very, very odd looking pharaohs, right? So many recessive genes. But this would not have been a practice that the Greeks would have followed or condoned. But yes, yeah, some of their neighbors would have done it. And who else behaves this way? Where else do we see in Greek mythology brothers married to sisters and gods. never working? The gods, yep. Aeolus and his family are more like gods than they are like mortals. They never die, they never work, and brothers and sisters are married to each other. So we can see that we've left the mortal world behind, right? None of these islands Odysseus visits seem to exist in normal time and space. Right, the last place he visits before coming home to Ithaca that is a real verifiable geographical location is this island of the Sicones that he raids and you know, tries to destroy, right? That's the last place he visits in the real world before coming home to Ithaca. Once he gets blown off course there, the rest of this takes place in some sort of a sort of fantasy version of the Mediterranean, where each island presents an alternative to Greek norms. Right? These are places that don't exist, that are peopled by monsters and gods. Yeah, Jenna. Do you think if it's possible that in reading this myth, and since it was a ancient Greek, it's something that uh, from the Mycenaeans and stuff. This was their way of maybe creating of what Greeks should not do. It was sort of a list of rules, maybe, kind of in opposition mm -hmm. to. I was. It's probably less formal than that because this was less, used for entertainment. I know it's less mm -hmm. formal, but yeah. it's sort of a lesson type thing. As Odysseus does these mm -hmm. things, he, uh, they're taught that these are things that they cannot do either. Sure. So maybe if it's you know, like say each story is done separately, mm -hmm. you know, so it's kind of similar to a bedtime, bedtime story we might learn. That's how we learn morals. Maybe that's their way of learning morals. And the, there are certain, if you look at like uh, some of the dialogues of Plato and certain other ancient Greek texts, there are certainly people who did turn to the Homeric poems for moral teaching. Um, one thing I will say, I, I think, you know, Odysseus definitely shows a learning curve from island to island. Although there are reasons why we can't necessarily trust what he says that we'll get to in a moment. Um, but most of these social codes, right, are things that the audience for the poem would have already been aware of. They were sort of already culturally pervasive. I mean, it, it, but yeah, it does help to reinforce, like, ah, yes, I recognize that taboo, yeah, and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah, you're, yeah, you're, you're, yeah um, you're, you're not, you're on the right track with it. You got, you've got, I think you've got the right idea here. That, yeah, these do present sort of negative examples of the sorts of things that happen if you don't follow Greek social practices. So if we get to the Circe episode, now here we have On Circe's Island, a unique danger What's this place like when he gets there? What do we see when we land on Circe's Island after 
half his crew is devoured by giant cannibals. We sailed on in shock, page 286, glad to get out alive, but grieving for the comrades we'd lost. And we came to Aia, the island that is home to Circe, a dread goddess with richly coiled hair and a human voice. She is the sister of dark-hearted Aetes, and both are sprung from Helios and Percy, daughter of Ocean. Some god guided us into a harbor, and we put into shore without a sound. We disembarked and lay there for two days and two nights, eating our hearts out with weariness and grief. But when dawn combed her hair in the third day's light, I took my sword and spear and went up from the ship to open ground, hoping to see plowed fields and to hear human voices. So playing lookout again. So I climbed to a rugged lookout point and surveyed the scene. What I saw was smoke rising up from Circe's house. It curled up high through the thick brush and woods, and I wondered whether I should go and have a closer look. I decided it was better to go back to the ship and give my crew their meal, and then send out a party to reconnoiter. So what makes him decide that it's better to go back to the ship rather than to press on alone? What does he see when he looks out over Cersei's Island? No fields, and just rising smoke. Yep, woods, brush, no fields, just one single house from which smoke is curling up, right? So not a civilized place. I was on my way back and close to the ship when some god took pity on me, walking there alone, and sent a great antlered stag right into my path. He was on his way down to the river from his pasture in the woods, thirsty and hot from the sun beating down. As he came out, I got him right on the spine in the middle of his back. The bronze spear bored all the way through and he fell in the dust with a groan, and his spirit flew away. Planting my foot on him, I drew the bronze, the bronze spear out of the wound and laid it on the ground. Now, given what we know about Circe and what happens on her island, is this stag probably just a stag? What has Odysseus probably just killed? Yeah, he's probably just killed a person. He's probably just killed a transformed man. Right, we see it's sort of anthropom the stag is sort of anthropomorphized here, right? You know, it falls with a groan, its spirit flies off to Hades. These are things that the Greeks would not associate with an animal. Not only that, but the episode itself looks a little bit similar to some of the battles between warriors in the Iliad, right? Guys poking each other with spears, and then one of them falls to the ground and his spirit flies off to Hades, right? So the stag is clearly anthropomorphized. Now, this is especially important given the discourse of cannibalism throughout the epic. Cannibalism is one of the great Greek taboos. You don't eat people. Seems logical to us, right? <laughs> you don't eat people. In fact, if you do eat people, um, it sort of it gives you a, a bacterial illness called prion disease that uh, eats away your brain. It's very similar to uh, mad cow disease. So yeah, don't eat people. If you take if you take nothing away from nothing else away from this class, take that away, right? Don't eat people. Yes. I'm sorry, sir. It's real. Oh, it's real. Yeah, it's a real thing. Um, it is, uh, it, it's been noted in populations that still practice some form of ritual cannibalism. Um, yeah, they get this disease that eats away at their brain and makes them go nuts. Yeah. So, good times. But there are a lot of Greek myths concerning cannibalism, right? The father of the Olympian gods, the Titan Cronus, um, in order to prevent them from getting more powerful than him, grabbed them from their mother as soon as they were born and ate them. 
Now, then eventually his wife gave him uh, something to make him barf them all back up. And then they fought. But yeah, this is sort of, you know, one of the kind of initial evils in sort of the history of Greek religion, right? The Cronus devouring his own children. <coughs> There's also a myth of a king by the name of Tantalus, who wanted to test the wisdom of the gods, so he invited him to a feast at which the dish he served was his own son, disguised in a stew, to see if the gods would recognize it. And they did, and Tantalus was duly punished. In fact, we see this sort of this horror of cannibalism in a lot of Greek stories, mostly in stories of fathers wittingly or unwittingly devouring their own children. So Odysseus and his men are unwittingly here committing a very, very grave sin. They don't know this is a person. They think it's a stag. And indeed, it never tells us explicitly that, hey, you just killed an ate a person. But the clues are there. Right. <clears throat> and when we get to Circe herself, right, what evidence do we see here that this is an unnatural sort of place? When Odysseus's men meet Circe in, in her own house, what's lurking around her house? Yeah, mountain lions and wolves. And how are mountain lions and wolves supposed to react when people come close to them? Yeah, attack or run. Yeah, attack, attack or run, right? Depending on how threatened they feel. Yeah, they certainly don't fawn on you and rub up against your legs, right? Unless, of course, the living is so you're trying to do that. Yeah, I, 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 yeah don't, don't try to pet the animals in a zoo. <laughs> that won't go well. <laughs> And, well, if it's a petting zoo, yes. If it's a petting zoo, fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, yeah. Don't, yeah. Don't, don't, don't try to, don't try to pet the wolves. They, don't, they don't like that. They don't. They frown on that. Um, but yeah. So we have animals, be wild animals behaving like domestic animals, right? Wild animals behaving unnaturally because Cersei has drugged them. And we talked a little bit last time right, about the name that's the epithet that's given to Odysseus through most of the epic, right? The word that is in Greek that is associated with him is polymetis. And what does polymetis mean? Anybody many remember? Many thoughts or strategies. Yeah, many thoughts, many strategies. Now, the word that often appears in association with Circe is polypharmacon. So we can recognize at least one part of this word, right? What's poly? Poly is many, yeah. And pharmacon, what do you think that means? Yeah, it's a, a, many, many drugs, many potions, many concoctions, yeah. And this is actually a fairly common way of representing women who practice some sort of magic in uh, Greek texts, right? Women's magic is usually accomplished, you know, through powders and herbs and drugs. That's the way that the sort of like the, the Greek witch operates typically. Now, how is it that Odysseus masters Circe and gets his men back? Yeah, he gives him an herb that will master all of Circe's herbs, right? Is the herb enough, though? What else does he have to do? Yeah, 
<laughs> he has to, she has to take this weird oath, right? That she will not unman him, right? Page 291, right? Cersei, how can you ask me to be gentle to you after you've turned my men into swine? And now you have me here and want to trick me into going to bed with you, so you can unman me when I am naked. No, goddess, I'm not getting into bed with it, into any bed with you, unless you first agree to swear a solemn oath that you're not planning some new trouble for me. So he said to take the herb, and then once Cersei finds out the herb doesn't work on him, what does he do? Pulls out his sword. Pulls out his sword. Yep. Yeah. Now, cup and sword are both conventional gendered symbols, right? Cersei is associated with the cup of drugged wine that she gives to the men who come to her island, right? So the cup, right, a receiving vessel is a traditionally feminine symbol. The sword, on the other hand, is a conventionally masculine symbol for fairly obvious reasons, right? Essentially, what is it? What's the sword a substitute or a symbol for? All right, we're all adults here. Yeah. Yep, exactly. It's a phallic symbol. The sword is a phallic symbol. So what does Odysseus have to do to master Circe, to master women's magic? Basically, he has to wave his manhood at her, right? And then make her swear a solemn oath not to try to take it from him, which she does readily. And then gets transformed from a hindering character into a helping character. Right, from that point on, she tries only to help Odysseus. But <clears throat> what this does is give us some insight into Greek attitudes towards gender relations, right? Circe lives on an island with no men, right? All of her attendants are women. And rules herself. Whenever men come to visit, she turns them into pigs. So Odysseus takes Circe's woman-ruled island and as a sort of substitute husband for a period of a year, turns it into a more conventionally Greek sort of place. Right, so what he's doing with his sword is essentially taking Circe's island and civilizing it in a Greek kind of way. Right, what this place needs is a man to take it in hand. Right, and Odysseus is that man. Oh, yeah, for, for about a year, yeah, yeah. The, and, the, and this, I mean, this is another thing, just to sort of briefly note about um, Greek gender discourses. Um, essentially, sexually in particular, men were socially permitted to do whatever the hell they wanted. Um, and there was nothing, their wives really had no power to stop them or do anything about it. Um, <clears throat> women were punished for sexual transgressions. Men weren't. Now, if a husband was abusive to his wife, her male relatives were legally permitted to step in and remove her from the household, and, you know, take her back home. But she had no rights to do that on her own. And when doing so, she lost rights to uh, her dowry and to her, ch to her own children. Right? Children were property of the husband. So we are looking at a civilization in which women were 
relatively regarded as relatively powerless. There's a great play uh, by Aristophanes. Um, it's called uh, Lysistrata. Um, it's a war protest play, and it's meant to demonstrate the kind of power that women could have if they chose to use it. Essentially, in order to end a war between Athens and Sparta, all the women of Athens first um, invade the treasury so the men have no more money to make war, and then refuse to have sex with their husbands. And so those two factors together lead the desperate husbands to finally call off the war. Right, so. Um, comedy. Comedy. Tragedy tomorrow, comedy tonight, yes. Um, <clears throat> but to leave that all aside for a moment, um, where are we for time? Pardon? Okay, so we do have a little bit of time to talk about Hades. And this is something I wanted to make sure we covered because it does fit into the larger set of afterlife um, myths we've discussed, right? What is Hades like as Homer describes it in Book 11? What's this place like? Pardon? Right, Book 11 starts on 296. Okay, it's dark. Where is it? If a living person can actually go there, what does that suggest about it? Some world. Yeah, it's somewhere in the real world. And while it's not easy to get to, it's someplace you can visit, right? Right, this is um, common to both Greek and Roman afterlife mythologies. They did believe that there were actually passages into the underworld from the surface world, right? That you could actually get there, you could actually visit. The Romans thought it was under um, a lake called Avernus. You could just sort of there was a cave that you could take under the lake and that would take you straight down to the trees. What else is this place like? What are the spirits in Hades like? Yeah, just yeah, ghosts. Sort of spirits flitting about, right? And if we look at the sort of people Odysseus meets, or he meets some fairly important people down here, right? Right. He runs into Achilles. He runs into Agamemnon. Right. Heracles. And what does it suggest about the Greek afterlife? That all of these great, all of these great Greek heroes, are all just sort of flitting around in the same place. Is there any reward in this afterlife? No. Everybody gets more or less the same thing, except horrible, horrible blasphemers who are punished in nasty, vicious ways. But there isn't really a good afterlife, right? There's the point where he's taught where uh, Achilles is talking to Odysseus, or on page 308. Achilles, by far the mightiest of the Achaeans, I have come here to consult Tiresias to see if he has any advice for me on how I might get back to rugged Ithaca. I have had nothing but trouble and have not yet set foot on my native land. But no man, Achilles, has ever been as blessed as you or ever will be. While you were alive, the army honored you like a god. And now that you are here, you rule the dead with might. You should not lament your death at all, Achilles. I spoke and he answered me at once. Don't try to sell me on death, Odysseus. I'd rather be a hired hand back up on earth, slaving away for some poor dirt farmer, than lord it over all these withered dead. 
So is Achilles honored in the afterlife as he was in the world above? He's just another ghost, right? Just another spirit here. And does he usually even remember who the hell he is? Most of the spirits have no memory, right? That's the thing that we're told is special about Tiresias the seer, right? Is that this guy has actually retained his faculties, retained his memories of, you know, from the world above. No other ghost in Hades has done that. Unless they do what? They have to drink the blood from Odysseus' sacrifice, right? Now, the sacrifice he makes, right? He digs a pit. He pours out some wine and honey. Sacrifices a sheep and a ram and lets the blood drain into the pit, right? What kind of sacrifice do we call this? Anybody remember? Sacrifice to the earth. Yeah, it's a sacrifice to the earth spirits, to the earth gods, right? The gods in the earth. But what's the specific name for a sacrifice like this? The libation is the pouring out of the wine, right? That's part of it. The whole sacrificial complex. What do we call it? It's okay if you don't know how to pronounce it. Exactly, Corinne. Yes, it's a chthonic sacrifice. Yeah. <laughs> right. If you want to draw the attention of the earth spirits or the gods within the earth, right, you dump things into the earth. And why is it significant that these spirits revive and regain their memories when they taste blood. Because blood is the life force of the living? Yeah. yeah. So drinking the blood gives them a semblance of life for a short time. All right, and this is part of why they're all so eager to get to it, right? why he has to fight them off until Tiresias comes. But there's another thing that's important here in Achilles' speech that points to a pattern that we see in many of the, uh, the speeches of the spirits Odysseus meets, right? But tell me about that boy of mine. Did he come to the war and take his place as one of the best, or did he stay away? Now, where else do we see something like this? A lot of the spirits all ask about their children. Yep. Their yeah, their sons specifically, right? <clears throat> they don't really ask about daughters. They ask about sons. They're not so much concerned about where their daughters are. Right? Agamemnon asks, you know, do you know what happened to my boy? Odysseus himself asks the shade of his mother, what's going on with my son? And, a and Achilles wants to know, did my son ever come to Troy, right? Did he show up and do my name honor? Why are they so concerned about their sons? Yep, that's the closest thing they get to real immortality. Right. Does my name survive in the world? Does my legacy survive in the world? And the son is the one who carries it forth for the Greeks. Because right. we've already sort of seen in the Circe episode uh, how women tend to be uh, devalued. All right, so that's about all the time we have for this. We're going to be looking at actually a very different kind of gender discourse in the poems of Sappho. He's probably the, Sappho is probably the greatest lyric poet of ancient Greece. And her work tends to sort of elevate uh, women's issues rather than relegating them to either the background or to something that gets in the way of relationships between men. So I have some reading questions for you. I have 
your last in-class writings to give back to you. 